All right, let's let's get started. It's great to see you all here. Uh, today, I plan to cover um, kind of an introduction uh, to Kubernetes for data scientists and ML engineers. And as the title implies, there are a lot of assumptions. Uh, there are a lot of assumptions on the level of familiarity uh, data scientists and ML engineer may have on, on infrastructure um, jargon and also assumptions on what we consider or what I consider in this case relevant for this audience uh, in terms of, of Kubernetes architecture objects and etc. So um, bear in mind that that yeah probably we are not covering everything and uh, I'll, I'll try to provide an overview. And uh, again, hope this is useful for you. So we'll cover, I'll start with why. Why Kubernetes in this context? What is it from different perspe perspectives? A bit of how it works and a short lab. And uh, feel free to ask any question during uh, the session. We'll try to uh, address them at the end. All right, a bit about myself. I've been working for the past 14 plus years on infrastructure. So my, my background is pure infrastructure from virtual, no, before virtualization from uh, migrating SCO, Unix um, machines to virtual um, Linux uh, <laughs> infrastructure and then uh, proper virtualization and then cloud computing and more recently, Kubernetes and, and the cloud native um, ecosystem. Uh, yeah, I hold the certified Kubernetes administrator cert, and uh, I'm proud to be a former member of the Kubernetes release team, not because it uh, implies some knowledge, really competency on Kubernetes itself, but uh, because it it's a, it's a demonstration of what humans can achieve. It's incredible to see how every quarter, every th three months, a group of volunteers throughout the world join forces and spend time to produce a new version of Kubernetes. It's amazing. All right, I'm a proud father of two boys. I love bike, but I love probably running more than cycling. And yeah, for, for some reason, there's always a song in my mind. <clears throat> All right, let's get started. But before I want to um, say thanks to Union AI for sponsoring uh, all the flat school sessions, Union AI is the company behind Union Cloud, a platform that provides a managed version of flight where you get um, some of the most uh, demanded features in terms of enterprise readiness. You can call it that way, like task level observability or monitoring, um, role-based access control, among others. And you certainly don't have to deal with Kubernetes there. But if you're here, I'm, I'm glad you're here and, and you want to know how things work. So great. Kudos to Union AI. Right, so why Kubernetes? Well, a, a couple of reasons. First, there was a study um, published a couple of years ago on um, the metadata of failures from one of the biggest and oldest ML pipelines inside Google. Uh, it's been running for more than 15 years uh, with some failures. And the study found that basically more than 60% of failures came from, were, were not ML failures. And most of them had a strong distributed, system, distributed systems nature. So classic failures like dependencies, pure downtime, latency, et cetera. Not, not really ML failures, but the classical, let's say, distributed system failures. So it's important, probably it's, it's the result of a, of a simple, uh, or of a single system, not a simple one, a single system, but it could be, uh, <clears throat> yeah, it could be uh, interesting to infer these results for, for the whole ML uh, design of, of, of systems that are reliable. And the, uh, the other thing is that, well, it's, it's a matter of fact that ML systems tend to grow like many other systems. There are different dimensions uh, on which an ML system can grow. 
if you find other dimensions or, or you have anything to contribute, just chime in in the chat. Remember that ML is not my background, but these are my observations and also what I found on, on academic research. So first of all, model count. You start probably with a, a small number of models and, and you will be adding more and more. And uh, also complexity. Mm. Your models will grow, will become more sophisticated, and that ends up adding complexity to the system. And finally, if probably if you are successful and depending on the use case, you'll get more and more traffic volume um, trying to retrieve uh, predictions or, or results from the ML system. <clears throat> so why this? Well, because scalability matters and it's been a um, poorly defined term uh, through many years in, in technology. Only recently I, I found, it's old, but only recently I, I found proper academic document on on topic of scalability. And it's basically a, a system is scalable if it has ways to improve the system capacity to handle more workloads. And if the administrators of the system can apply these strategies or these controls uh, multiple ways at a low cost, right? If, if you can tweak the system just one time and the next time it, it won't handle more load, probably it's not very scalable. So there are not systems that are not scalable or infinitely scalable. It's it's a range, right? And uh, uh, the, the sooner a system uh, runs out of strategies to handle load, uh, probably it makes it less scalable. Uh, so in the example here in the graph, you see that the system administrators were able to apply the strategies or controls uh, twice to keep the response metric at, at, under an acceptable level. Uh, by the third time, it was harder, and the fourth time, it was just not feasible. The, the cost was too high, and the response metric was rendered the system unusable. So that will be the limit of scalability in the system. So um, what does it have to do with ML? Well, here I'll say that for for value generation, considering that probably you are aware of, of this metric, that majority of the ML uh, projects never get to production. And there are many non-technical reasons for this, but probably one aspect that could help uh, improving uh, this metric will be building an ML platform that is highly reliable and scalable. And there are many trade-offs that you need to make to, to achieve both. But um, my goal is here to kind of position Kubernetes to be this kind of a substrate where you can build a platform with these features. All right, so what is Kubernetes? <clears throat> Probably this is a first introduction on why we need it on ML and, and for data intensive apps. But what is it? What is Kubernetes? Well, there, there are different ways to define it. Probably if you, if you Google, you will find a mul multiple definitions. It's an orchestrator, it's an API, whatever. But for me, uh, Kubernetes is like a thermostat. Uh, this is an analogy that is even used in docs, in the Kubernetes docs. And I, I haven't found a better way to explain what is Kubernetes so far. So if this is the only thing you remember from this session, it's great. Kubernetes is like a thermostat and probably all of us here know how to use it. So you set the desired temperature of the room and you forget about it, right? You set and forget. There, the, the, um, the actual thermostat will work 24 seven to make the actual room temperature match the desired room temperature. So if, I don't know, if the temperature goes above the desired level, it will kick off the fans. And if it's the opposite, it will, I don't know, turn off the fans or start some heater, et cetera. But besides what, what, what the thermostat ends up doing, the thing is that for the user is very simple. It's a simple interface. You just define what you want to achieve. In this case, I want the, uh, I don't know, 70, 72 Fahrenheit in, in the uh, room and that's it. 
you set and forget. And this is exactly what Kubernetes does. Uh, Kubernetes provides the user a simple interface where you declare the desired state, right? And you have a controller that will work 24 seven to actually make the actual state of the infrastructure match what's, what's in the desired state. This is the reconciler pattern. It will reconcile the desired state with the actual state. Every time there is a deviation, there is a change, unintended change on the actual state. For example, some uh, downtime, some node is offline, etc. It will do whatever it takes to make the desired state match the actual state. So, in this pattern, in my opinion, it's where the actual power of Kubernetes lies in its unparalleled reliability. Uh, this is what you probably have heard about it, the declarative infrastructure approach, where you declare the desired state of your infrastructure and you forget about it. You probably have used some other options in the past, like infrastructure as code, Terraform, Ansible, etc. cetera. Uh, in those options, you declare the desired state of your infrastructure, right? And you submit this to a controller but this is not a loop, right? So every time there is a deviation in the actual state, probably you will need to run some process, some batch process, whatever, to detect this change and then apply again the desired state. So the main difference is that Kubernetes is a control loop. It's a, it's a big array of controllers that all, all of them follow this control loop pattern. So all the time is watching that the actual state matches the desired state. <clears throat> That's Kubernetes. So if we dive a little deep, you will see that there are three planes, uh, and this is usually um, used to describe systems, the management plane, the control plane, and the data plane, right? So starting from the from from bottom up, the data plane is where the actual workloads run. Your flight workloads, your whatever you're doing with data, it works there, it, it runs there. So in this case, it could be these rectangles could be, I don't know, physical servers or instances in the cloud, et cetera. And if we, you, what you have running in there are your workloads. We will give it, we will give them a proper name and uh, the common slides. And probably, probably, for example, you have some nodes with access to GPUs for inference for some other use cases, but, but this is the kind of the data plane. This is where the actual workloads run and probably where your data lives also, right? Uh, no difference there. Uh, the difference is in the control plane where the majority of the logic of Kubernetes uh, lives. As I mentioned, there are multiple controllers and uh, every controller um, manage a single type of resource. There are different type of resources. We will, we will give an overview about some of the most common uh, types of resources, but all of them have a dedicated controller, not for every instance, but for every type of resource type, there is a controller who will do exactly what we saw in the previous slide, right? To actually reconcile the desired state with the actual state. And the users or the systems that will interact with uh, Kubernetes will use the API server as the gateway uh, to either define the desired state or just mm, run queries and know what's the current status and what's happening in the cluster. But the, the main point of the of this interface or the or the connection with the user or or the CI/CD systems or any other platform that is that is using uh, Kubernetes is basically to declare the desired state, and that's it, right? <clears throat> Again, if you have any questions, just drop in the chat. I'm more than happy to address them at the end. <clears throat> so the other point here, important with Kubernetes, uh, is yeah, it's an orchestrator. Yeah, I, I, I haven't used the term uh, only now. It's an it's a container orchestrator. Yes. And as you may know, one of the main expectations on an orchestrator is that it schedules workloads, right? Not only in terms of time or, I don't know, like a cron job uh, at a specific frequency running something, 
but we expect more than this on Kubernetes, we expect that the scheduler also is aware of where is the best place to run a workload, not just run it every hour and that's it. And just, I will let you know if it fails. Now, it will also decide where is the best place to run this workload. That's one of the main uh, differences and one of the outstanding features of the Kubernetes scheduler is that it will detect every request to create a new workload to or to run a work, new workload and it will inform the api server about where, where where what is the best place to run it it takes into account multiple criteria but one of the criteria is the actual resource utilization uh, in the nodes in the actual instances where your workloads are running in the um in the kubernetes jargon this is the worker node right, where the actual containers are running, right? So the scheduler will watch for re, uh, resource utilization. It will make decisions to try to balance utilization uh, throughout the cluster, <clears throat> right? Another important feature here, or, or yeah, something that it stands out in the Kubernetes scheduler is how extensible it is. You can you can tweak even from from the most basic stuff. You can, for example, define, hey, I want this group of workloads to to run only on the nodes who have GPUs, for example, right? And if there is no GPU available, don't schedule. It's it's very easy to say this, and you can also um, tweak the logic and adjust kind of the rules on how the scheduler decides where to run workloads. This is not needed in 80% of, of the times. You don't need to tweak the logic of the scheduler. You just need to define this kind of rules, hard rules hey, of, of, I don't know, hey, I will group these nodes with GPUs and uh, a specific workloads who need GPUs will run there. That's more common. Uh, the the point here is that scheduling is is scalable, uh, and probably by now you have a better idea of what it, what a scalable means here. It has multiple controls, multiple strategies you can uh, apply to um, enable the scheduler to handle more and more requests, parallel requests at the same time. And uh, also, it has some mechanisms like auto scaling. Auto scaling can also be automated. Uh, you can define rules and the scheduler can act automatically to even expand the cluster or shrink down the cluster if it's needed, right? It's, it's very powerful. You can also write your own scheduler. All right. <clears throat> so um, in terms of resources, now let's uh, describe a bit about the most common resources in Kubernetes. And I will start with namespaces. Naming spaces are kind of the substrate where every other resource lives. Most of the resources live in a namespace on Kubernetes. And it's a way to isolate resources, uh, one thing. And they work in tandem with a feature that probably uh, Linux folks here in the audience will remember, the C groups. So naming spaces allow you to um, isolate resources and um, manage resources for specific teams or applications, etc. But and and also C groups will make sure that uh, team A, for example, if you establish a limit or a quota for resources, uh, C groups will make sure that uh, team A cannot cannot exceed the limits, right? The, the, they are kind of contain not only in terms of resource ownership, but also in how they use the resources, right? So this is very important, especially as, as you start scaling, uh, growing uh, the system. And if you, in the ML context, you are either running workflows or, yeah, developing models and running models for different uh, teams, different applications, naming spaces are kind of the de facto way to manage resources for different apps. <clears throat> okay, so even the, the system chips with a default namespace. So the first thing and the fundamental and unique of execution in Kubernetes is the pod. I, I won't explain what a container is, probably it's not the, the scope of the talk, but 
but just briefly a container is a way to package the application and dependencies in a in a lightweight fashion much more lightweight than, than many others uh, and typically on kubernetes you schedule a single container per pod the pod is again a logical construct uh, and is the is the fundamental is the atom yeah well atom is not fundamental anymore but yeah it's, it's a fundamental unit of execution in kubernetes right uh probably out of the many things you can say of a pod um i will i will say a couple of things first labels are everything Labels are everything, not only for pods, but for Kubernetes. All the resources in Kubernetes can use labels. And we'll see a little on, later on uh, why labels are important, but uh, it's uh, the system is designed to also organize the resources by using labels and even control uh, how to group those resources using labels and then selectors, right? Okay, and the second thing that I want to say about pods is that it's probably the only resource in Kubernetes that that actually consumes infrastructure resources like CPU, RAM, storage. The pod is the, the only resource that does this. Most of the other resources, unless you create a custom resource, but most of the other, mm, uh, let's say native resources, are logical constructs that you you won't see them consuming resources exactly. Only the pods run workloads, right? So in the worker notes uh, that I just uh, described a couple of slides ago, what you will see running mainly is pods, right? And, and everything ends up being executed by a pod. All right. Um, yeah, we'll touch a little deep on data storage because here we are uh, trying to give this, maintain this focus on, on data. By default, uh, what happens here is that if we start from, from left-hand side, uh, the on container or the, yeah, the storage or the file system in a container by default is ephemeral, means that Whenever the container crashes or it's get it stops or gets deleted, and whenever that happens, the data that was written by that container will also disappear, right? So it's the life cycle of the data is tied to the life cycle of the container or the pod in this case, right? That's the default behavior, and that's fine for for most of the workloads. What we call the stateless. Uh, workloads uh, that doesn't need do not need to store anything, um, <clears throat> but probably you have different needs in your application. So there are different options for data storage. The next next up is the config map. <clears throat> it's it's interesting because the config map is not really storage. Uh, it's a Kubernetes resource use only to mount configuration data to a pod. So for example, if a pod needs to access a database, uh, how does the pod, where's the database, where are the credentials, or where are the secrets to use to connect, etc. Typically that's in a store in a config map that the, that the pod mounts, reads, and the application inside the container will, will use to, for example, connect to a database. Right, so it's not exactly storage because you cannot write there from the pod. It's a it's a resource sitting in the Kubernetes cluster that you mount uh, to a pod. Uh, next up is the uh, empty deer um, volume type. It's a, it's again a volume that, as the name implies, it's, it's it starts empty <laughs> uh, and exists if the pod is running so no matter if the even if the container crashes uh the um the data on the empty deer is is safe but if you or the system or for some reason the pod gets deleted uh also data in the empty deer gets deleted right um but there are some use cases that probably make sense for for ml for example for for check checkpoints for long executions Empty here is a good way to handle this because once the execution is over, 
probably uh, the important data, the, the output of this execution has been already transferred to the next step in the pipeline. And probably you are using a, a nice workflow orchestrator for this. Uh, but in any case, the output has been, um, yeah, communicated to the next step in the pipeline. And uh, so the container can be, the, the pod can be destroyed and the data in the MTD uh, can also be destroyed. So it's, it has some use cases where it could be interesting. It's very simple to set up. Uh, next up is the host path, is where you mount a folder or, or a disk, where most typically a folder in your machine to the path. Uh, it has some security concerns because host path can be and has have been used in the past uh, to expose credentials from Kubernetes components and run container escape attacks and other forms of privilege escalation. So not great if you ever need to do this, mount it as read only. Uh, it's a recommendation. But if you're in a situation where you need to support uh, an ML system on uh, local Kubernetes environments, not in the cloud, for example, just, just servers with local storage, it's possible you can use the local volume type. Uh, it doesn't have the implications or the, or the problems of, or the, of the host path. The only problem is that obviously is tied to a node. If this node uh, goes off, well, the, the volume will be inaccessible. But you, you can share it on, through different pods, different hosts. So it's kind of a midterm solution. But the, the most Kubernetes native and widely used option is the persistent volume claim right here in the, in the, in the right-hand side. It's a way to, again, claim durable storage. It's completely declarative. I mean, it's, it's part of the definition or the intention of the application. You find, hey, this app needs, I don't know, 100 gigs of storage with these characteristics, that's it. This is more mostly for block storage, but uh, the important piece is that it uses an API that hides the implementation details and makes it really simple for the developers to claim storage and do it even dynamically without the intervention from anyone on the infrastructure team. So uh, a bit more details in that. The API is called CSI. Not not that CSI, not that TV show, but the Container Storage Interface is the API, and it's a way for for storage vendors, providers, especially block storage, um, to um, expose a standard um, a standard interface for pods to claim storage. So you will have a piece of block storage, a slice of it is a persistent volume that ends up being claimed. If it matches, for example, the capacity, uh, the policy, the storage class name, uh, if if there is a match, uh, it will be claimed by the pod or the pods that, that need it and will be mounted, right? That's for block storage. For object or blob storage, you will typically use and the S3 API, you don't need to exactly mount anything. Uh, it's just API calls to either write or read. Okay. Cool. All right. So the main question here, and probably a question for you all is, is this enough? And yeah, probably not, right? Probably this is not enough. Um, you can have different ways to um, mount volumes, to write data, to read data. Um, probably this is not enough, especially if your ML system interacts with other systems in the organization, which is typically a case like a CICD pipeline, like all the clients or the applications that consume the actual outputs of the ML system. So running everything on a path Mounting a volume, a volume probably is not enough. You need more than that. So Kubernetes, as you covered. So the next thing is the deployment. Deployment is a resource, a native resource in Kubernetes. And uh, with the deployment, you define, you declare again the 
desired state of the whole application. So for example, in this case, I will say, um, hey, Kubernetes, I need this application to have four replicas at, at any point in time, four replicas in this case. Remember the thermostat? So I need four replicas. What happens if some, some of the pods crash? Immediately, what Kubernetes will do is to kick off uh, the creation of a new pod to replace the old one, right? Um, because it, it, again, it will work relentlessly to make the actual state of the infrastructure match your desired state. Again, if you if the changes are uh, top down, let's say, if you say, no, I, I don't need four replicas, I need six replicas. Immediately when you apply this change, uh, again, the Kubernetes API server will trigger the creation. There's a control for that. that the deployment controller will, will trigger the creation of the additional uh, two pods in, in this very simple example, right? So, um, and, and the other thing is that, well, that, that makes the deployment self-healing in a sense, right? Because it's protected against failures in, in pods and, and it has controllers for, for everything, for the storage connection, for connectivity, et cetera. There are controllers everywhere in Kubernetes that will make sure that it will reconcile the actual state with the star state. How does the API server, the controller in this case, knows what pods are part of this application? If you have dozens of applications in the same cluster, how how can we identify? Well, we use the, the tags or the labels that I described at the beginning, and there's a selector uh, that in this case will use the label that we applied at the beginning to uh, to say, hey, every pod that matches this selector that has this label, this key value pair, uh, I assume it's part of this application and I will I will handle uh, the rest, right? So that's the deployment <clears throat> resource. It's fine, but again, I don't see a user here. I just see pods uh, connecting to data. So uh, yeah, again, what happens if something fails? Well, again, uh, it will kick off uh, the creation of a new pod, right? Awesome, great uh, animation. <laughs> All right, so the next the next bit probably uh, moving a bit up in the hierarchy of of resources in Kubernetes is the service, <clears throat> and the service is a way to expose a deployment, a group of pods and resources, etc., uh, with a specific and a single endpoint where now a user or an external system will use this endpoint to connect to the application. It's like a load balancer. If, if probably if you're um, familiar with this uh, term, the load balancer is this central component and you uh, interact with this component, but you, don't, you are not sure what's behind it. There's a component in the middle that uh, it's the, the front end for, for the users. In this case, it's not really that it load balances. I mean, it's very basic in terms of load balancing. It just distributes incoming requests. And um, for sure, if, if there is a pod that is down, it, it won't send requests there. And probably uh, even before that, the uh, deployment controller will, will create a new pod and uh, will add it to the service. Right, so um, this is the service. There, there are other resources above the service, like for example, Ingress. If you this is for a single app, but what ha what happens if you have multiple apps? You will need a service per app, more and more services. And if you're running the cloud and uh, you're using the load balancer in the cloud, it implies more and more cost for every load balancer you will need to pay. So probably it can become cost prohibitive. So the ingress is like a multiplexer. It's a way to define, hey, depending on, on these rules, let's uh, redirect request to this service or that service or that other service, right? So I, I won't touch on, on the ingress too much, but I, I see that for most folks, it's a bit confusing. And again, if, if you want to see a session, on, for example, on just ingress, I will be more than happy to do this. Uh, just let us know. Um, all right. 
earnest. Um, it's it's okay for you to wait a little bit for the question, or does it need to be now? Just let it know. Cool. I, I just want to ask right now. Yes, right now, like cool. uh, we just just the back slide. Uh huh. Yeah, well, um, yeah, let's let's complete the lab. It's not that it's not a long lab, and then we can go over all the questions if you don't mind. So, yeah, there are many ways to run Kubernetes. There are many ways to deploy a Kubernetes cluster, even locally. Uh, you can you can start with just using Minikube. It's a package. It's maintained by the Kubernetes community. It's it's fine. It's it's good. Uh, probably it has more um, features enabled than you may need. Um, you can use K3D or K3S from Rancher. It's pretty cool, lightweight. It has most of the stuff you need. Uh, you can start in the cloud, or you can just create your own on the hard way. I mean, using Kelsey High Towers, like the yeah, Kubernetes, the hard way. Yeah, I tried that in the past, and it's 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 incredibly long, an incredibly long process. Uh, that the conclusion after that is, yeah, I I need something different or a manager. This this is crazy. Uh, but for now, we will use uh, the um, playground uh, sponsored by Docker. It's right there. I will I will also put the link here in the chat. Um, if you already have a Kubernetes cluster, that's also fine. Uh, and probably you will find this too basic. But this is an interactive playground that will give you, I think it's four hours of um, access to a Kubernetes Kubernetes cluster, not fully featured, but a Kubernetes cluster where you get to see some of the behavior of resources. So next space is uh, the new instance. So remember that I mentioned that there are worker nodes that run your workloads, uh, but you probably are wondering where where the control plane runs, where there are master nodes. In, a, in, a, in this case, we will use a single node to both for both the control plane and and also as a worker node. And if you use Minikube or K3D or, or this kind of options, that's the case by default. It will deploy a single node and that single node will be at the same time, master and worker. But in production, that's that's not a good idea, right? In production, you need to have at least one master, ideally a, a cluster of master servers where you cannot run workloads and then a group of worker nodes where you run workloads and not the control plane, right? Um, again, this is a session for data scientists. I, I, I didn't want to dive too deep on the Kubernetes architecture, but probably this is all for introducing the commands here. Uh, the first option is initialize, the first step, initialize the cluster master node, right? A master node that will be where the where the API server runs, basically. So you can just copy and paste and run this. There's a whole process behind this. And there's it, it could be pretty long, but it's basically bootstrapping all the elements for a Kubernetes cluster to actually be able to respond to queries, create resources, all the stuff that we just saw. Uh, this is doing it. And it will store metadata on an Etsy uh, cluster, and you don't need to touch that. I hope. Uh, initialize cluster networking, otherwise it won't work. And uh, next piece is, in this case, we will uh, we will obey. I I wanted to run a different type of workload, uh, and if you are running on a proper Kubernetes environment. Uh, you can try, for example, this one. I will put it in the Zoom chat. And uh, yeah, it's it's also here in the flight, the hardway repo. Um, it's a manifest basically to deploy 
everything we just saw, uh, storage class, a persistent volume claims, persistent volumes, and deploy a couple of stateful applications, a Postgres database and a menial object storage that, by the way, is used to deploy Flag. But it's a good way to um, see how all the pieces fit together. I don't, I don't deploy it here on, on the playground because everything will remain pending. I mean, it doesn't have the ability to, to consume local storage, whatever. So even, for example, if you see here, uh, sorry. Oh yeah, my number one uh, productivity tip in a Kubernetes environment is the use of alias. Uh, K equals cube curl or cube CTL, cube control, whatever. And I'm so used to it, but just K get pots. Uh, there you go, it's pending, right? And you, and you, if you describe, sorry, when you describe in Kubernetes, you need to uh, tell the API what kind of resource. In this case, it's a pod. And uh, yeah, I mean, the, this node is a control plane node and cannot run workloads. There, there's a way to change this, but it's beyond the scope of, of this talk. And even if the pod is running, it makes not, not a great difference. Um, <clears throat> I just want to point to a couple of things. First, the pod, it's scheduled on the default naming space, right? Everything or most of the resources, especially pods, run on a naming space, right? And uh, it it will have a node. Why it doesn't have a node? Because there is a rule that prevents the uh, scheduler, it failed the scheduling, prevents the scheduler uh, to actually run workloads in a in a control plane node, which is a good idea for production. So you can see the scheduler here intercepting a request. Hey, you cannot run this um, in this node, right? You can see here the use of labels, right? It has a couple of labels and I, I believe this thing also creates a service, right? And if you describe the service, um, also you can see that there are some abbreviations for resources. I can say, for example, service or SVC, which is uh, interesting, right? Nginx uh, SVC, uh, there you go. So it has a selector that says everything that matches this label, app equals Nginx, um, I will handle this, right? It's, it's part of the service, I will expose this, right? And you can see here that it will be a match because it, this pod has the label, right? Uh, the status is pending. Uh, there, there's a lot of content out there on, on pod status, but right now pending is basically the scheduler is, is preventing you to run this, right? From running this. And uh, inside a pod, as I mentioned, typically it runs a single container. In this case, uh, you, can, you, you have only a single container. Which one? An Nginx uh, server exposing the 84 TCP protocol. And uh, yeah, there are some other things there that we don't need, tolerations, we don't need that, right? So if you explore, like, for example, storage class, uh, I don't think there's anything, uh, but you get to see this manifest. You can see that, for example, we use uh, this portion to create a storage class. Uh, that uses local path provisioner from Rancher, et cetera. And there are some persistent volume claims. Hey, I need 20 gigs uh, with write and for Postgres. And I need for, uh, yeah, I mount this in the deployment and I need something similar for Mini. Yeah, YAML. I didn't promise yet that you will not see YAML. Uh, if you want, if you need, if you want to learn Kubernetes, it all starts with YAML. I'm sorry. I don't know, bad news, but it's the truth. You need to know YAML, probably not, not an expert, but it's the, um, the actual interface used to both declare resources or it's also useful to know to troubleshoot for troubleshooting purposes, but probably data scientists and ML engineers don't need to troubleshoot Kubernetes cluster. You have other problems. <clears throat> right, so yeah, I think this is a, it's a introduction, uh, hopefully friendly one to Kubernetes in the ML context. 
Um, so yeah, any question, any comment you may have so far? Yes, I have a question. Um, you, at the beginning, when you mentioned like the namespaces and resources, you mentioned that the, there is some limitation that we make. So to separate uh, like the app services, etc., and like uh, when you said like these limitations, uh, they apply separately to each uh, like namespace, or mm -hmm. we have like one limit uh, that uh, is general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So. Um limits and quotas typically the the thing you use um you can establish limits for pods for example you can establish uh the default request in terms of cpu ram storage and you can also establish limits right and this pod will will always run in a namespace namespace by default don't have any limits nor resource quotas anything but you can create those. Um, let me see if I can find it real quick. Uh, but yeah, you can create resource quotas and resource quotas are applied to name spaces, right? In this resource quota object, you say, hey, this, I, I, I don't care what the pods will ask, but the only thing I will say is that uh, resource, uh, this namespace only can reach to a maximum of n number of CPUs, RAM, and even GPUs. Right, so um, let me point you to docs. I will share this right away. And um, yeah, this is the way to um, yeah define limits <clears throat> that apply to, in this case, to namespaces. And you can see here that there are limits in terms of CPU memory. And uh, for other resources, in this case, for GPUs, you can also establish limits. Right? And they will be enforced by the by the C groups that you don't need to touch. You just need to define this. And uh, it's, it's it's pretty easy. Uh here. Well, this is longer than, than needed. It established multiple resource quotas. Uh, but only this, it's enough uh to establish a resource quota, and uh, that's it, it will be enforced. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks to you, Nikita. Right, who else? Any other question? No. All right, well, with that, um, if you have any other question after this session, feel free to ping me on, on LinkedIn. I will say I'm uh, David Espejo on LinkedIn. Uh, you will probably find uh, the same picture that I use for this session. You will find it there. So it's easy to recognize. And uh, yeah, it will be great to connect. Um, if you still use X or Twitter, if someone still use that, I'm there as David Mirror. And um, yeah, it will be great to keep um, chatting. And the uh, there will be next sessions. There will be follow-up sessions. And um, I hope we can see you again. <laughs> so if no other question, yeah, thank you all for joining. And see you in the next one. Thank you.